there we go. All right. All kinds of people coming in. Thank you, everyone. We were just talking about how we saw the thread in Sistership about whether or not rights exist. And we we're just so excited about that. I, I, I didn't have a chance to like read everybody, but it's like, mm -hmm. like where else can you have a meaty conversation like that? Mm -hmm. This is, it's so good to talk about definitions and whether or not something exists. And unless you're talking to someone Chief who is disagreeing with you. Welcome, everyone. I'm going to have everyone briefly introduce themselves just in case you're here and you're like, who are these chicks? <laughs> who are these sisters? So I don't know who wants to go first, but uh, I'm happy. Mother of five, homeschooler, and publicly educated all the way through. Yay. So I'm trying to catch up to uh, a, a better educational system, right? The best kept secret of homeschooling is that I get to redo it, <laughs> which is so <laughs> such a blessing to me because so much more than what I experienced. And, and I went to a good school. Yeah, I represent. That's right. <laughs> and I am Misty Winkler, and I was homeschooled. My husband and I were both homeschooled, and now homeschool ours. We have two graduates, three still at home, and a grandbaby. I'm, I need to like start adding that to my bio. Yeah. Braggy, braggy. It's the most. You can just drop the kids. <laughs> I feel like that's what happens, right? We're like. I'm only going to introduce myself as this person's grandmother. That's the most important thing. <laughs> as soon as the grandchildren, I think, outnumber the children, then we can just drop them and mm -hmm. move on. Yeah, for sure. But public college, right? Yes, I went to University of Idaho and still definitely have been reclaiming my own education. While, And then that's the thing is our education, anyone's education, really ought never to end. We're all in. Yep learning and growing and there is always more and that should excite us not discourage us totally agree my name is brandy i'm wait where's my finger texas i'm in <laughs> texas the promised land of texas children only two of them am i currently homeschooling because the other two graduated and one of them left me for a girl but i'm only a mother-in-law not a grandma so mm. it's good to have goals and what else can i say Oh, okay. So since we're giving our educational backgrounds, I went to Christian kindergarten, but then I had to repeat kindergarten because kindergarten made me so nervous that I wet my pants. So there you go. Then I went to public school. Then <laughs> this was given to that. That was actually given to me by Charlotte Mason, Northeast Texas. And so then I went to public school, but then I went to Christian college. So it's a mixed bag. But here's the thing with Christian college. Christian college may have Christian content, but most of the time, I think the educational philosophy is actually secular. So how you learn or the types of deficits you have are probably like the same. It's just if your school is theologically conservative, then there might be like entire content areas that you didn't get brainwashed on or whatever. But anyway. I am thankful for my education, regardless. So, okay, so before we get into some of the nitty gritty about the topic of the stable and steadfast mentorship, we want to briefly explain like what a school sisters Sophie mentorship is, what our goals for it are, that kind of thing. So, who wants to explain what a mentorship is and generally how it works? I will. Okay. Since I am, this is the queen. Somewhat, yeah. We need to come up with a new, new term, but yes, since I'm in sistership the most, everybody's active, everybody participates. But how we run this is for our selfie members, you get a, we pick out some books. And this year we have Lighten the Load. We'll talk a little bit more about that too. Because in the past, we've totally given you a fire hydrant level of no. content. And we realize that you also are homeschooling your children and trying to keep homes. And we might be, we might be asking a little bit too much because we pre-read all of these before we bring them to you. And so we feel like, oh yeah, we can do this. <laughs> so we're basically cheating all the time. We are. We are. <laughs> so it's not that we have just much better run homes or anything like that. It's just that we have done the work and then we're asking you to do it when it's probably a busier season for you. So 
we are going to do weekly readings. We'll do little summary posts that include some questions and some thoughts to ponder. And then you will interact with those. So you'll do the reading. You'll probably narrate to your husband and children or friends. And then you'll come back in and add your thoughts to the discussion, which is pretty much the best part. It's really making you think. And then you get the opportunity to express that. And that's that dialectic when we're trying that iron sharpens iron. We're getting those discussions going and really talking about it because reading books is great. Reading a wide variety of books that you may never have picked up on your own is great, but it is the assimilation, right? It's making it our own and applying it to our own lives, which is why we always talk about reading widely, thinking deeply, and applying faithfully. And this is where we get to do it together and we get to see how other people are applying it and it just sparks ideas for us. And it is just so much, it, it's such a great way to get everyone on the same page too. And I feel like I've got people coming alongside me and doing these things and understanding these same concepts. And it's just, it's so encouraging to be a part of this. Mm -hmm. Then we'll have faculty of friends, this where Brandy, Misty and I discuss ideas, other things that we're reading, things that are happening in our lives and talk maybe a little bit more philosophically about some of the ideas or try to. More Brandy and Missy, but, and then we will have Zoom meetups where you all don't just get to chat in the chat box, but you actually get to come live on screen and visit with us. And those are really the best ones, right? Where you get to talk about it. And we actually are just going to mostly listen um, because what you guys have to say is brilliant. It's so excellent. And you have so much insight and wisdom in your own experience. And that's what we really want. Because as we constantly say, we are not gurus. We don't want to take that. You guys, we want thinking moms and we want to hang out with you <laughs> while you're doing the thinking. Like, that's fun for us. I don't want to just sure, talk about my opinions on it. I've heard myself talk. <laughs> I don't know about you, but I always have felt like when I do, when it's really good books, but when I I'm, go to a book club in person, online, whatever, it's like, there's always people who have an angle I just never even would have thought of. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that is where the expansion happens, where all of a sudden you're like, whoa, mind blown. I never even had that thought when I was reading. That's why people talk about echo chambers being dangerous for various reasons. But I feel like really they're just boring because there's this all of this part that you're missing out on where people just expand your understanding or cause you to ask a question you wouldn't have thought of or whatever. So that's what I'm looking forward to. Like the conversation that's been happening. Yes. Actually. Yeah. Preemptive. I love it. <laughs> that's right. That's right. So who is the mentor? Yeah. I was going to say that's where I love the note Brandy made in our notes. But when we say mentorship, like we are being mentored, but we're all being mentored. You are not being mentored by us in this. We are all of us being mentored by the books, the authors. We're going to the text, to the sources, and trying to learn and glean from the great conversation and the people who have kept the great conversation going and the people who have added to the great conversation. We go in and we learn from them. I think it was you one time, Misty, a long time ago when we were recording, who brought up the idea that they're called authors because they are authorities. Oh, yeah. Oh, that was big in my class I took with Dr. Schlecht. Mm. Authors. I forget what, like, like he, it's the text. It's the text. <laughs> so that he was very big on that. They are the authorities. Mm -hmm. And he was pulling out how that was a, has been a very important thread throughout classical education. They are authorities. Mm -hmm. So author and authority go together. I like it. Yeah. I think probably for many of us, like when I was a young mom and even now I see it, like, I just want a mentor. I want somebody in like business gurus and all this stuff. Like you just need a mentor. And I lived rurally and I had way too many kids to like farm out and try and find a mentor. And so I totally thought books were my mentors, right? I got great authors and I just said, Lynn, they're going to teach me and I can pick it up and leave it as needed and it fits into my life because 
the reality is I don't have time, hours of time to go and be mentored. It's just not realistic for any of us. And yeah. Yeah. It's great. Let's talk about the topic a little bit. So why did we choose this topic? And I know we all have a different angle on why this was appealing to us. Um, I wanted us to start with the dictionary definition from the etymological dictionary so of the word right. Obviously, there's right like the direction, right? You're going to the right versus going straight or to the left. Like, that's not this one. So this word right is from the old English. I'm assuming you'd say it like right, but it's so it's R-I-H-T, which is West Sax Saxon and Kentish or R-E-H-T, which is Anglian. So it's an English. It's like a traditional English word, actually. So the etymological dictionary says that which is morally right, duty, obligation, also rule of conduct or a law of the land of a land. Also, what someone deserves, a just claim, what is due, equitable treatment. So we actually debated a lot over the, even the title of some of this because lots of times in, in current Western culture, and I'm pretty sure this is not just the United States, like, because I feel like I see this in like newspaper articles and stuff from other Western nations. Like saying that you have a right is about demanding something from someone else. Right. Traditionally, that wasn't really the case. It's about recognizing what rights are and then realizing that has limit that places limits on the government. It places limits on you as far as what you can do. And it might even give you obligations or duties mm -hmm. for whatever country you are in. Does vary a little bit depending on what type of government you have, right? Like a, we're in a republic. If you're in the United States, you're in a republic, that's a little different from some of the other forms of government. So it's not like all the applications are going to be universally the same with every person who's in this group, because it depends on what kind of government you live under also. But this idea of, did you write this? Because I don't remember writing this. Maybe I did. I did. I okay. Added. It's so good. That's like, that, I don't remember that. Okay, you can say it. Oh, so a right is about applying justice. So we're not talking about like standing on your rights in the like, I don't know, modern. And I feel like it goes along with feminism and all kinds of things where it's like, I have to protect myself and put myself out there and defend myself against all these oppression and whatever. And it's all about like demanding and taking, being autonomous. And that's not the historical sense of the word at all it rights have to do with knowing what justice is so what someone else is due basically from you it's a obligation that you are under in how you treat other people so we're going to go into reasons why we chose this topic and honestly a lot of it has to do with it being in the news. Like, it just seems like constantly it's in the news where you see these governments or individuals who are suggesting that the world would be better if certain rights were taken away. Certain rights that traditionally in the West are viewed. As, but it's so if you follow me on Instagram and I know some of you do, then you know that I post a lot of news stuff. And one of the common responses I get is the idea of like, how are you not overwhelmed by the news? Or I'm glad you speak up. I don't feel like I could speak up. And when I push the issue, the response is usually like, I don't feel like I've read enough. I don't feel like I have a firm foundation. I don't feel like there's all these different, I don't feel that would be solved by reading more. A lot of it is just feeling for the magnitude of what they're facing. And it's like, I have this feeling like something is wrong, but I can't articulate it. I And I'm not sure if I'm even right. And I want to be careful about what I say because I can't really defend my answer if I say it or that kind of thing. Right. So, and you will be jumped on. Yes. Yes, you will. Yes, down. you will. Mm -hmm. So I feel like I was given a great gift in high school because my public high school, I was actually, California has this thing. I think actually it might be all the states, but they have this thing they call the Constitutional Convention. So my government class, like, I had to read and memorize the Bill of Rights. I had to know the Declaration. I had to know the Constitution. I had to read court cases. I had to know all of these documents and defend them. 
And so I actually felt like I've got a great foundation of understanding of rights. But it wasn't until I was older that I read anybody outside of the United States. Everything I was given to read was American. And I got the idea, this is like a special American thing. And it wasn't until I was much older that I was like, oh, it's an American thing. Right. <laughs> like, this is a tradition of the West. Like, I didn't know. I just was like, oh, look how lucky I am or whatever. But I, it's like, even though some of those documents say things like they're inalienable rights and imply that they're for all persons, like, it didn't connect in my brain. I really thought that would be a Texas thing. <laughs> like, I think it's be super special here. Anyway, so for me, I felt like let's get at the root of some of these anxieties by reading a little bit more. We're not going to read everything. There's so much that we could read, but we tried to pick like the most important influential things that we could think of that would fit into 10 weeks. Because I can't say I didn't try to shoehorn more and then realize Mm -hmm. I'm doing it again. (laughs) So who wants to go next? Someone else give me your reason because I know all of us have different reasons for the appeal here. One important reason that I think we need to be having conversations like this as moms is women. It's a little bit different, I think. We have a different focus as moms in particular that is good that actually really strengthens our resolve for the study, our stamina for the study, because we are, even if you aren't homeschooling, As a mom, you're still educating the next generation. You're still the facilitator and cultivator of your family culture, of family conversation, of what is and isn't okay to say and do in your family. And so rights actually do apply in family life even. And and it came out in that Mm -hmm. chat already going on in sistership, which is super interesting. But so it applies even just practically in family life. It's That's not really the angle we're going to go into a ton, but it does apply. But more than that, now that I have adult children as well as children still in the home, my brand new, very favorite thing is when one of my adult sons texts me an article they think they'll like, I'll like, or some quote that they read, or like, a meme. Sometimes it's just a meme. (laughs) (laughs) I'll take it. But like, they know that I'm interested. They know that if they find something interesting, not everything they find, I'm not interested in everything they're interested. They know that I am interested in big ideas and they know my interests. And so they identify when we share an interest and will contact me and share something with me. And when we are just in the thick of it with only little children, it's really hard to see forward to that day. But you are in the conversations that you have and in the reading that you do just for yourself apart from your kid's education. You are laying the groundwork for that to happen later on down the road because you can't just go from using your time only to do the work around the home. That has to be done to you. But from just work and child rearing and then escape, that doesn't translate into being an interesting person for your adult children to have a meaningful discussion with. So we really need to be laying that groundwork now. And it it doesn't have to be huge. And we're going to talk about taking the easier path a little bit earlier on that. We have an even lighter load version of this mentorship, but we need to be cultivating our minds and our interests so that we stay relevant. You could think of it that way. Yeah. So I I think we should cut that short because we do have other things to talk about. That's true. (laughs) And I myself, because of my excellent public school education, right? I did take an AP class, AP U.S. history, and I did have an excellent teacher in high school. Like, I would say I did learn a lot. It was, I think, Randy and I've talked about this before. It was the American pageant textbook, which I don't even think they have in schools anymore. So um, good. It was. For a textbook, it was excellent. Mm-hmm. And I had a study group where we would discuss things. But coming from a non-Christian home and a non-Christian 
background, I had no idea about this. And I didn't even know I didn't know until pretty much last year, because when I started reading The Golden Key, which was in our previous mentorship, which is about authority and where it comes from, I was like, I know nothing about this. Of course, it's from God, but this is something that is self-evident that I was completely unaware of. So when I was reading that book, I was like, wow, I really need to do some more. So I actually picked up this book, which is one of our books that we're doing so that I can get a little bit more of a background on this because he follows it throughout the history. And yeah, so I, I just did not know what I did not know, which is how it always is. And it's always good to be educating yourselves because it keeps you humble. So true. And so that's where it is. So I've read this book, I think once or twice now, and it's, it's been really helpful. And right now, my sons and I are, are going through the French Revolution and we're learning all about that stuff, which will come up all the time because since I'm learning about it, guess what? You get to have my narrations on this. But I'm not gonna, like we said, we're going to keep it short. It's just making so many connections. I have to tell you an embarrassing story. So I listened to this instead of reading it. And I'm terrible. I try, but I'm terrible at listening. Like I just don't retain the way I retain if I saw it. Like if I saw it, like I could tell you where it is in the book and where it is on the page of the book from memory, usually if it stuck out to me. Yeah. With uh, no, just nothing. Just I. So I, before we, as we were planning this, I actually, so Dr. Sunshine is an old friend of ours. We met him like 20 years ago. And I messaged him a question that I thought would help us make some of our decisions as we're trying to pair back. And he's like, really, that's in my book. So I had to tell him, I was like, I listened to your book and it's a great regret of mine because now I realize I wasn't listening. So now he knows I'm going to read it. But anyway, I embarrassed myself in front of the book's author. So that was fun. Okay. So I want us to dig into the topic a little bit because one of the things we were talking about at the retreat was just this idea that the idea of natural rights really originates in the Ten Commandments. But I don't know that's going to be in any of the books we're reading. I can't think of it. Some of the books we're reading, I've read better, like more recently than others and more thoroughly than others. But we just wanted to talk about how some, not all, some of the rights that we're going to be discussing are implied in the Ten Commandments. So if you remember the Ten Commandments, I'm just going to go over them really briefly. First four are about our vertical relationship with the Lord, right? So you've got things like don't worship other gods. Don't make an idol. Don't take the Lord's name in vain. Keep the Sabbath, right? That's the first table of the law, we call it. Then second part is six because 10 minus four is six. And that's our horizontal relationships, right? So our relationships with others. So you've got honor your father and mother. Don't murder. Don't commit adultery. Don't steal. Don't bear false testimony, which is lying. And don't covet, right? So... We're going to talk briefly about what might be in these, but I think you have something to say, Misty. I'm looking at the notes here. Things are just appearing. I thought, I think before we start talking about Ten Commandments and how it relates to rights, I think it is important to establish why the Ten Commandments applies because we might think that's God's law to his chosen people in the Old Testament, right? So therefore, only Christians have to obey the Ten Commandments which is not true. So the 10, we'll give a little brief history or whatever, but background. The Old Testament is full of God's law. There are three kinds of law that God gave his people. God gave ceremonial law, but that's like all the sacrificial system and all the eating rules and all of that. And all of that was to prepare his people for Christ and teach us about Christ. So the ceremonial law no longer applies because Christ has fulfilled it. Then you have the civil law, like the Siyanami law, like the governmental law for Israel that God gave. And that no longer applies in a technical sense after the nation of Israel was no longer a nation, but it gives us principles of government. Like this is how... These are things to consider The Westminster or Confession calls it the general equity. It teaches us like the one of their laws was you have to have a fence around your roof, like a deck. 
And it's like that teaches us that you as a property owner are responsible for other people not being injured. So there are principles we can take from the law, even though it's the civil law doesn't apply as a civil law, as a government law. And then there's the moral law. And the moral law just teaches us what morality is. And all people are bound to the moral law. That is the law that we are all breakers of. And so you're not a lawbreaker unless you are bound by the law. So the moral law is revealed in the Ten Commandments and it applies. And I just was doing a little brief reading before we got on in R.C. Sproul's Truths We Confess. And he was saying this is because it's based in creation. So all people, because all people were created by God, all people have a connection to God, a covenant with God. We have duties and obligations because God is the creator. And it, you don't have to believe in God for God to exist and have authority over you. So the moral law has authority over all people because it is God's moral authority. So to piggyback on that, I would say that's actually where we get the idea that these rights are natural, because what that means right. is it's part of nature. So it's part of the created order. I do think some of the things called natural rights are probably more debatable than others, especially maybe the ones that are like outside of the Ten Commandments. Like we're not really, you have to work through it to get there. If I So there are some people who have rejected some of those things for that reason. So what I want to ask you guys then is what are some, like we don't see all of them in the Ten Commandments directly, but what are some of the ones that you see when you look at the Ten Commandments? Anybody, anybody? I'll take any of them. This is Abby, want to talk about Yeah, Abby, do you have a favorite? <laughs> I think that I have an example from the right to property that we were talking about before. So oh, good. So okay. It's just common, right? Okay, well, my first, my first, my first. How oh, do you see the right to property in the Ten Commandments? Oh, yes. So we have not coveting. We have, let's see. Yeah, not coveting. Not being envious of what your neighbor has. Like those things to, to me go together. How about and not um, stealing? <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Stealing too. <laughs> if there's not private yeah, property, yes. you cannot steal. Yeah, you can't steal. Okay. okay. So, yes. <laughs> or borrow without permission because that's <laughs> yeah. I had it in my family, right? So that's fair. I was jumping to my thing. So, yes. Thou shalt not steal. Easy. There we go. Slim down. My boys are grabbing each other's by the shirt, shirt calling today. And one holds it up and he's like, what does this say, mom? And it was the brand, Levi's. And, he, and, he, and I said, Levi's. He goes, take that shirt off right now. That belongs to me. You do not wear my shirt. And the other one is like, I just put it on. I, didn't, I just saw it was in the pile. Now they are twins and they share a room and a closet. But that one had purchased those shirts himself. And he was very irritated at the other one for doing this, right? This is very natural. Like, this is understandably something when people take your possessions but without your permission and consent and it is a violation and there is an anger towards it like it it is naturally in us like you cannot have my stuff uh, every time my kids drink out of my water bottle and i tell them do not drink my water i get irritated with them <laughs> bring your own water bottles i know you have the i purchased them before no so the right to private property is behind a lot of laws we have. And we can't go into this for every single one of them, but this is a really like low-hanging fruit, easy one to extrapolate. So you everything from, for example, I got in a car accident and my teenage girl totaled my car from behind. Why does she have insurance? Why does her insurance have to pay to replace my car and all these different things, right? And it has to do with private property rights. She destroyed my private property, not through intent, but I will say through neglect. I'm pretty sure she was on her phone or distracted in some other way because zero breaks when I was at a standstill in traffic is like a sure sign she wasn't paying attention. I'm pretty sure. Anyway, but like you have that, like why when the government needs to build a road through your property, does it have to go to court? Often do they have to compensate you for that way? They can't just take it like all of that kind of stuff, like regardless of how you feel about things like eminent domain laws, why is that even a thing? Private property rights. Why do you have 
barrier, like borders to your land that have been determined by a surveyor, private property rights, like on and on. It goes way beyond laws about things like stealing, breaking and entering, that kind of stuff. You could even, I think, say that the some of the laws that like Florida is famous for as far as like the right to defend your property actually comes from private property rights and not necessarily the right to bear arms existing outside of that. Like it's actually tied into the property rights. If you have property, then there's like a right to defend that property. We can talk about how Christians should handle that. Like that might be different, but that's different from the literal right, if that makes sense. We nuance things in our faith all of the time. Like you have a right to life, but you also have the right to lay down your life. Right. Mm -hmm. So like things like that. Anyway, which I guess I just brought up the next light at the next right on our list, which is the right to life. Right. Yeah. The castle doctrine. Exactly. I couldn't remember it. Lauren, thank you. <laughs> I was like, a man's home. Is it king? <laughs> no, that's not it. <laughs> so thou shalt not murder. We see a right to life. Right. And that would look when we talk about abortion, but we also talk about things like how we handle Let's say Canada telling autistic people that maybe instead of getting that thing that would help them, they could just go die because that's been happening in Canada, right? All of these issues that we see in the news are actually, why are they issues to us? Because thou shalt not kill, right? So we have a right to life, but what that looks like is stopping other people from killing a third party sometimes. Mm -hmm. What else? So here, I think there's justice, the right to, I think in America, it's usually put a right to a fair trial, but I think it's, you have a right to justice, to an equal standing before the law. And that's established just in the fact that the 10 commandments apply to all people equally. Like in principle, you can see it, you can establish it that way. That there isn't one set of commandments for these people and another set of commandments for different people. But then there's also, you shall not bear false testimony against your neighbor. And as a exposition of false testimony, throughout the Old and New Testaments, you see a priority on a requirement of two to three witnesses before truth is established. So due process is something God requires of people. Yeah. I see Valerie's question here. How do we reconcile private property rights when Jesus told people to sell all they had and give it to the poor? I'm sure you're getting some answers. This is actually a great conversation to have inside of sistership. We don't really have time to, because that's a huge rabbit hole. But what I will say is, if you look at the early church, private property did not cease to exist with Christ. They're always what, so like you have churches that are meeting in privately owned homes of very wealthy people. So there, you, we're going to have to nuance that a little bit, but are we supposed to be generous? Are we supposed to lay our resources out for other people? Absolutely. That wasn't something that was to be, that was the, it was voluntary, right? That's why when you have that situation, well, and an and Sapphira. Sapphira, yes, I almost said Priscilla and Aquila and I'm like, no, those are the good people. I don't know why I put these together in my brain. Anyway, but why you have this situation where like the apostles are like, was it not your own even after you sold it? You didn't have to deceive the church. You could have sold it and given part and that would have been fine. They are killed for lying. Interesting. When we go back to like this idea of justice, they were killed for injustice. They were misrepresenting themselves to the church and the Lord struck them down. So yes, exactly. Patricia, see, I'm telling you, Patricia is my twin. I don't know if you guys yes. realize this, but we think the same thoughts all the time. Anyway, who put in pursuit of happiness? Because I was like, I uh, don't see that. But just go ahead and tell me. Okay. This one's like not as obvious as all the others. But so I made this connection because like we keep saying natural rights and I'm like, just like, what are the natural rights? Is there some canonical list or something? I don't even know. So I looked like, what are natural rights? So like, what are the natural rights? What counts? Because like, I'm pretty sure the, the porta potty on the side of the road is not our, like, <laughs> not everything we might say, especially today as Americans, is a natural right is like, what are the, and so you have the American 
Declaration of Independence that says life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness are some of the inalienable, inalienable rights. And so happiness is one of my little pet topics that I like to follow as a rabbit trail because in Jefferson meant in the classical sense of happiness, that Aristotelian happiness is the life of virtue. So it's not a life of hedonistic pleasure or doing whatever you want or individualistic pleasure. It is living in accordance with the virtue. So it really is that you have the right to obey the Ten Commandments. No one can take that away from you. And it's the same thing with like with the property. If I own property, I can give it away if I choose, but someone else can't make me. So this is where we have part of the established establishment of religion or the right of religion is that no other man can tell me I can't obey the Ten Commandments. And so especially the first three commandments where that are about worshiping God, we have a right to worship God. And no government can interfere with the worship of God. That's why you have the apostles saying, oh, well, we cannot obey man. We have to obey God. Right. So, right, like they're commanded, for example, to quit preaching. And the people are like, why have you kept doing it? I'm like, oh, higher authority than you is the answer. Right. Yeah. I think that's definitely going to come up in our conversations in the coming weeks. That's my guess. I noticed here, I'm assuming, Missy, that you added this to the right to liberty. I put that one in. So this is something I pulled from Truths Be Confessed by R.C. Sproul. Okay. He, in his chapter on God's law and moral law, he talks about all people are under God's moral law because of creation. And so then he talks about the creation ordinances, which includes marriage. So marriage exists for all people because it was established by God at creation. And so man can't redefine it. Man is held responsible for breaking it, that kind of thing. But interestingly, the Sabbath is also a creation institute as well as in the Ten Commandments. So he says that, that the establishment of a Sabbath is, a par is partly that you have the right to worship. Okay. You should have time for that. But also, no person has the right to exploit another person's labor. So every, you can't, a person really can't fully belong to another person because of the Sabbath laws. Oh, she's frozen again. Oh, no. No, you're not. Not for me. Maybe oh, I'm okay. Frozen. You're fine. So here is what he says. Let's see. So he says, many states used to have blue laws that govern certain behaviors on Sundays. The laws did not require people to go to church, but they did prohibit commerce on the Sabbath day, except for emergencies. States observed these laws on the assumption that a day of rest was good for all people, no matter what their religious persuasion was, so that workers would not be unduly exploited. It was mandated by the state that there be a day of rest, which we also see in the statement of that commandment in the scripture. It's about your workers and your animals. So it's, it does have to do with exploitation. So here's quoting R.C. Sproul. If Sabbath is a creation ordinance, and if the state is called by God to maintain the law of God outside the church, then it would be the state's duty to legislate with respect to the Sabbath. He says, that sounds radical today, even to Christians, because we live in a culture that has completely repudiated that way of thinking. Civil government in the United States has declared its independence from God and from his law and has become godless, pagan, and barbarian. Yeah, then he goes on to freedom. But any government has the right to enact laws, also has the right to enforce laws, and every law that is passed limits people's freedom. So he talks about government being subordinate to God always, and Christians, a part of Christian's duty is always obeying God rather than man. That is really super interesting. I just never thought of it that way. That's no, really I never had either. Yeah. And I, it's interesting because I also was trying to figure out like freedom of religion, reconciling that with the first four. And so like maybe that's how that fits in. Because I, 
like my my gut is like freedom of religion is a thing but like out so i think that helps put some of those pieces together i'll be curious to read more we have a whole work that's basically on that whole that letter concerning toleration that whole thing is basically freedom of religion i think there might be some other things but that's the main thing so are there any secular companies that mandate a day of rest i don't know because i mean even other businesses i can think of that do that they're usually mormon owned they're not secular like the owners are doing it for a similar conviction so i don't know that would be an interesting thing though to find out if that i don't know so my grandpa was not religious but he actually ascribed to that even a man like Everyone needs a day of rest, even if they're not going to church. And like, that was his thing. I don't think he ever darkened the door with church other than his wedding. But like, that was his thing. And he worked six days hard and took a day off every week. And that was that. So, you know, I think the French did try to destroy the calendar in the French room. Like, yeah, like they, a 10 day week. They renamed it. They took away all the holy days and they tried to put it a 10 day week. Because they wanted to get rid of the Sabbath. The metric what, system. They wanted no, the metric amazing. system applied to everything. Yeah. And <laughs> what they found was that their animals and their people couldn't hack it. Interesting. It's like God designed the world to run on six days of effort and one day of rest. And any other way, you get way more burnt out. Your animals fail. Things were not doing well. Okay. I didn't think we were going to have this, but Haley saved the day. And we actually do have a copy of the timeline that I can share. Oh, good. Hold on. I'm trying to. Sorry, I have to look around. If you want, I have it up soon. So I need to oh, okay. Why don't screen. you share it then? I just okay. feel like I trust you to do the tech better. Yeah, Abby yeah. might be the queen of the stewardship, but I'm the queen of the tech. That yeah. is 100% it's true. Not even it, might be, it might be 200% true. And I am the IT person at my house. And I'm like, way Which below. So <laughs> I, yesterday, you guys, I put together a timeline. And this will be available inside of the mentorship. When you go in there, it'll be just one of those little buttons at the top. If So for those of you who want to geek out and see it or like download it for yourself, you can, you'll be able to do so. But I put together this timeline. This is not everything that ever happened, but this is just like a lot of the main things that happened. So if you look at where we are, we're near the end of that timeline. Obviously, there were things that happened after 1691, but a lot of people are familiar with the things on rights that were written because of the American Revolution or because of the French Revolution or even after that or whatever. I think it's the history before that that gets a little bit, I don't know, like a little bit dark. Like we don't really dim. Dim is the word I'm looking for. Like we don't really know it. So anyway, I just was going to briefly go over this. As far as I know, based on my very limited, you could totally download this and show it to your class, Lauren. Feel free. This is not, it's really not proprietary information. I found <laughs> it on the internet. But as so, or oh, go ahead. We we'll just say that it actually should start with creation. God creates man yeah. so that man has a particular nature. I even thought yeah. about that, but there were only ten circles. You put a little sun at the beginning or something. I should have. You're right. right. I should have. <laughs> so I know because I was like, we're talking about the Ten Commandments, and I don't put them on there. So I guess we could think of this though as like, who really started to develop? natural rights as a thing to talk about independently of other things Cla oh my gosh c-l-a-s-i-c -S guys oh we already God. fixed a couple typos but we really did I but don't them. download it yet we're going to <laughs> <laughs> make the new and improved version because Haley wants to make it 17 times <laughs> thank you for all your help <laughs> oh my gosh she okay so your service needs Haley's very best yeah really how would we function without her? Okay, so so the the great philosophy philosophers were the ones that seem to have first developed it, right? But then we go to Cicero, who was Roman, right? So 44 BC, he introduced juice natural. That is basically natural justice. 
natural law, which is very much related to natural rights. So we're not reading through things specifically about natural law, but it's really hard to separate the two when you're reading because there's this underlying sense that the Ten Commandments are always there following you around, right? <laughs> so then here, these are things I did not know, a couple of these here in this middle row here, because in the 1250s, that, oh my gosh, you guys, his name is Henry, and it's Brush. <laughs> okay, so just read it, and then we will tell people when it's ready, okay, Brandy? Just read it and stop it. I'm worrying yeah. about the error. Oh. Just read it in your notes. Okay, I will, on but it says Harry, and I'm really upset that it says well, it Harry. It says Henry on the Google Doc. Okay, Just that makes me feel a little better. Okay, so Henry Bracton's On the Laws and Customs of England. This is an English work, and I did not even realize that in England there was work on natural law, natural justice, before Thomas Aquinas wrote Summa Theologiae. I did not realize that happened, like, in that order. That was really interesting to me. It would have just, been right along, or that would have been just after Magna Carta, which was going kings, not God. Yeah, true. Which I almost put the Magna Carta on there, but again, only 10 circles on my template, sorry. <laughs> so then we get, so like late 1400s to early 1600s, we have something called the School of Salamanca. I literally had never heard of this before, as far as I could tell. It, so it's a group of Spanish Catholics. They're literally at a school. It's a college, right? They're in Salamanca. And they were developing this philosophy that some people think is even like maybe the beginning of Austrian economics in some ways. Like there's different schools of thought that seem to have come from this group of Catholics that were working for over 100 years, all on the, building on each other's work, which was actually building on Aquinas's work in Summa Theologiae because he talked about natural law. And so then they were developing ideas of natural rights based upon Aquinas's work on natural law. So then even though the Spanish and the Dutch were like, we hate each other, Hugo Grotius in 1625, which was right about the end of the School of Salamanca, some people think he was building on the School of Salamanca's work. And he was very influenced by them. And he wrote something called De Jure Belli Ac Pactis, I think is how you say it, but it's Latin for just war theory, the justice in war and peace, something like that is what it translates to. So this is a just war theory, but also includes some stuff about natural rights. And people think that especially that part came from this school of Salamanca. So then we get into some of the stuff we're actually reading. So in 1644, the earliest work that we're reading is John Milton's Arapagitica. It is one of my favorite things because he developed very fully, not just the idea of the right to freedom of speech, but why it's so important in terms of intellectual development and like the flourishing of your culture. So his, he's very fully thought it out and it's just, you're going to love it. You're going to love it. It's great. Some of you here may have read this with me years and years ago on an earlier, on our earlier platform. So then we get into the late 1600s and now those things that we're reading, right? We're reading this. Th that's when those were written. So it was like 40, 45 years after Milton, we get John Locke's work on toleration, his second treatise on government. And then we have, let's see, did I just realize those are out of order? That will be fixed too. Okay, so if you go to the end, Thomas Paine's rights of man. Somebody asked what were other contenders? We seriously considered Thomas Paine's Rights of Man, but we just decided that it's so entrenched in the French Revolution that it feels like you need to have a, a better historical background in the French Revolution to really get what he's saying. And we didn't want to spend a lot of time on that. But if you want to read more on the Rights of Man, we recommend the book called The Rights of Man. <laughs> and then finally, in my misrepresented order, we get 1762, which is Jean-Jacques Rousseau and his work on the social contract. And the, probably the most important point in that book, and I wrote it down for you, is this idea that your rights precede the existence of the government. And one of the primary responsibilities of the government is to protect them. So he establishes that. We didn't look at it very seriously because Misty said, nobody needs to read Rousseau as a first. <laughs> she might have been biased against Rousseau, I'm just saying. Everyone should be. 
<laughs> so you got to see the third rough draft of my timeline and I will fix it and then you can download it inside. So only 10 circles. Yes, only 10 circles. We have to have limits on things. <laughs> All right, good. So that's your brief history lesson for today. So now we're basically at the end. We're going to talk some logistics really quickly. So somebody explain like how, like what are the next steps here? So your next step is to get the books. Oh, true. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So they are all, I will have you notice, small books. So we're going to be reading. So, and we also made Brandy limit the number of weeks. They put so many limits on me, you guys. So many. I dropped the link to the book list in the chat. So you can link on the, that. The Milton book is so slim that it got lost on my bookshelf. So I don't have it in my stack right now because I can't find it. It's Mine's over on my coffee table. But oh, in yeah. one of these Dover classics, the version we have, but it's just an essay. And you can find the Locke and the Milton free online. Yeah. Like it's figuring out the assignment if figuring out the assignments may be a little bit tricky if you don't have this copy but we these are cheap super cheap. these are cheap and then slaying leviathan is by glenn sunshine and it's little and we're reading this over the course of 10 weeks there are nine chapters and an epilogue and an epilogue so that made it super easy and if you have canon plus the audio is on canon plus so if you're like me, though, don't do audio. <laughs> it's so it is. What is it? Oh, I don't know. I think it is. Is it? Wow. An audio of it? Because I think they allow you to. Maybe I missed remembering. It's possible. It's, I want to try this make open source, but that's yeah. the wrong word. It's not, it's in the public domain. Public domain. Yes. So the next step is to get the books that we're reading mm -hmm. and then the assignments with the discussion will start Monday, October 28th. So there will be, we'll make a post in the sistership space, which also feeds should already be able to see in their sidebar. There will be an assignment and discussion questions from Abby on Slaying Leviathan. There will be um, a small section. We're going to be reading the second treatise of government over the course of 10 weeks. So like, it's just going to be little bit by little bit. And I know we said earlier that we pre-read all of these and then pick. I've read Slay Leviathan actually twice, yeah. but I've never read John Locke and I'm going to leave the discussion on John Locke. So yeah, I have not read those either. Yeah. It's going to be great though. <laughs> Brandy brought the books to us before like, the yeah, you all were to read it ahead of time. It's like, hey, I didn't get these yeah. until last week. <laughs> So the danger of us telling you anything far ahead of time is what if we change our minds at the last minute? Then you're like, I bought this book and you're not even using it. Because Which that's, happen once. that's what we do to each other. <laughs> All right. Morgan confirmed Milton's essay is on audio on Canon yeah. Plus. So awesome. But if you're like, Brandy, don't even bother. Seriously. Uh, Seriously. But then, and every week, Brandy is going to have a post on a small section of the i can't do milton's essay mm -hmm. and that's for five weeks and then of uh, the second treatise of government or no that's what i'm doing the letter of toleration toleration yeah so they're going to yeah. be super short assignments all of them broken up over that whole time so that they can talk to each other and make those connections mm -hmm. over time but there will be three discussion posts each week that's how that works and it is for sophie's we're, this is an open event for everyone that can introduce it. And because we thought it was a good, and there's already discussion in sistership. So yeah, that's totally fine. But the discussions of the book themselves are going to be in the Sophie section. And the in Sophie event, you'll find the faculty of friends and the Zoom meetups for the discussion. And the we'll, schedule, and I will be uploading the events so you can get yourself RSVP to it, so you'll get notifications yeah. and things like that. So and you can show up. The Zoom, they're Zoom style, so you don't actually have to have Zoom on your computer because it's it is like Sistership has its own thing all in the oh, right. Zoom. So right. anyway, for those of you who worry about Everything. that kind of thing, everything's going to be just in Sistership. Yeah, yeah. like this 
event is. And we are going to be recording them. And so they will be, there will be replays for anybody live or later. Um, now I know some people get a little uncomfortable being in the camera. So, but we really want to encourage you to show up and participate because it really does make it so much better and it will never be shared outside of sistership. So it's just right. people in our membership who get to see it and we're not sharing it anywhere else. It's private. When we say choose your level of participation. Yes. If you are a brand new beginner who is like, I just don't know, or you have a new baby and you're like, I just don't know, or something else. Uh, that is really time consuming, but you want to participate, we recommend that you just do Slaying Leviathan with Abby. That book is like, our, if you think about how we do history assignments sometimes, like this is like our spine text, right? And this is going to give you a fuller history. These are examples of books from history. This has more of a far reaching timeline inside of it. So, and it's also easier reading. It so is. if you're struggling with the reading level because your baby kept you up so night and you're so tired, then that's a good one to do. So then you can add other things on top of that, right? Like the John Locke stuff and the John Milton stuff. But for those of you who want to do it, but you're like, I can't do everything. How about just do this? Mm -hmm. And then you're not feeling like you're constantly behind. And that's okay. And you can still, like, you can still eavesdrop on the conversations on the other books. It's not like you will still gain a ton of knowledge because he goes from the early church and, and beyond and then the medievals and Reformation and all of these different things. Yeah. Like he gives a great overview. It's very mm -hmm. nice bite sized pieces. Yeah. It gives you a lot of good information without details that overwhelm you. It really isn't very long of a book. It's under 200 pages and that's complete content introduction yeah. and notes so it's very doable yes yep. and so like, not a ton of text on right it. no not and room to write in your margins which is nice <laughs> yes slaying leviathan is appropriate for teens I would oh say. yeah it'd for be sure. great fully fine right. that would be great yeah. yeah so so these other books are awesome for those of you who want to geek out with us and talk about orig more original historical sources these would be considered original sources but don't feel like you have to. We just, in some of the feedback, it was just like some of this is too much for some people in different stages of life. And so we want to be respectful of that and not have it be like you do this or you're out. Like this way you can have your cake and eat it too. Yeah. Choose the level that you're ready for and come and join us. So it starts on our first week is October 28th is the Monday. So what I put on the schedule that's inside the mentorship. It has all the weeks laid out. That the the dates. It has all the dates. Yeah. I used to put just the Monday, but that got confusing. So it has the date for each of the weeks. And then I put the break weeks on there. So we say 10 weeks, but there are break weeks. Like I don't remember exactly what it is, but let's say like week eight doesn't directly follow week seven or something like that. Because it's Christmas and we're not going to have assignments during Christmas, right? So the mentorship is going to go to the end. Of January. January 31st. Is right. Yeah. Right. So, but it, so in there, there's actually four break weeks because we're taking three weeks off for Christmas and we're taking a week off for Thanksgiving for United States Thanksgiving. But that also means there's time for you to catch up if you get a little bit behind. And you can call those catch up weeks as well instead of break weeks because let's be honest, probably mm -hmm. going to be some catching up over Christmas right. break. Except we do think you have a right to a Sabbath. We do. Cool. Yeah. Right. Okay. <laughs> but we won't make you. That's right. We won't make you take a Sabbath, but we recommend it. <laughs> okay. So as far as like how things go during the weeks, it's not like we're going to post all three discussion things on that Monday. They'll start popping up on Monday. But like you're not behind. You also, if you get a week behind and you want to go back and you want to leave a comment on week one Sorry. but we're like a week two that's fine too like this is not it, this is spaghetti this is not like this rigid boxed thing it's like how women talk to each other that's what it is <laughs> so if you want to go back and dig up old problems from week three feel free <laughs> okay is there anything else before we go because we've been here a long time we did good is that all i think it's gonna be a lot of fun i think so too yeah. i think it's been great so all right you guys can get started on your reading 
And then we'll see you uh, in 10 days when we start. Bye.